right, amen. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Preached my message, my funeral message out of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. Uh, of course, it's, uh, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Death is not the end for the Christian. Isn't that a neat thought? That's such a neat thought that death's not the end. Um, I spoke to Mrs. Uh, Rogers about, uh, was it uh, Emma? Emma Liddy. She was seven years old and she got cancer at the age of two or four. I, I don't remember. Um, but she passed away and they did a funeral for her in Bluffton this past Thursday. And uh, we were speaking about um, uh, just some other things. And she just mentioned to me, hey, um, Liddy, uh, Emma, Liddy passed away. And just my heart melted for a minute for the parents, uh, for the family, because I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. Uh, he's eight now. But to imagine them battling cancer and they lose their hair. And for a girl, you know, that's her glory. Her hair is, you know, such pretty hair and long, blonde, pretty hair and all those things, you know. And uh, I just kind of, my heart was broken for him because uh, that's such a sad thing. And, and I, didn't, I didn't even begin to question why, God. Uh, I, he's not going to tell me why. Uh, besides what's been written. Man, we live in a sin-cursed world. That's all there is to it. Uh, that's, the, that's it. You, why? You live in a sin-cursed world. And um, uh, it, it's not fair. As I said in, in, in church and in the funeral yesterday, life is not fair. It's not fair. And you do your best. Let's just say you settle in to do your best and do good works and serve the Lord and do all these things. And you still have a Job experience. How in the world is that fair? Well, it doesn't say in the Bible anywhere that it's going to be fair. It says that it's all going to work together for good. And if you'll just put your stock in that and put your faith in that and say, it'll all work out for good. How is, how is Kirsten, how is that fair? As far as I know, she wasn't a mischievous, loose, rebellious teenager. She had a good spirit. She was obedient, and she she stuck it out, so to speak, in a lot of different ways. And she got touched with transverse myelitis. How is that fair? I know some teenagers who get should get touched with transverse myelitis, and it ain't Kirsten. You say, how can you say that? According to their works, that's what they deserve. But life's not fair. You work hard, you think you're going to get the promotion, and the bum behind you got it. How is that fair? Life's not fair. So since life isn't fair, I go to the one who tells me it's okay. I go to the one who says it'll all work out. Uh, and um, uh, I have a, uh, we had a great time through the funeral uh, and a lot of people understood and heard the gospel. And I think we're helped um, and comforted with hope uh, that um, uh, the Lord's coming back. Now, 1 Corinthians Chapter 3, verse 11 through 15. Verse 11 through 15. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be manifest, for the day shall declare it. Well, what day is that? Judgment day. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon. Now remember, your, use, your, your work is you're building, whatever your works are, you're building them on Jesus Christ. They'll be tried by fire. So if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire." Uh, know ye not, oh, I'm, that's my text verse, but I'll finish the, the chapter. Know ye not that ye, uh, that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, 
him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, I want to focus on verse 11 through 15. Now, um, uh, I want to talk about, uh, continue and try to finish tonight. I don't know if I will, uh, and I'm not in a hurry to finish it. I don't mind taking uh, Wednesdays and Sunday nights to do a service or to do a series or, or break it up. Uh, but uh, about motives or good intentions aren't enough. Good intentions aren't enough. Now, the nearest thing, Dr. John and I said, the nearest thing to the heart of God is keeping people, keeping sinners out of hell. And that's been, uh, Brother Hiles said it, and the people that follow Brother Hiles said it, and I said, the thing nearest to the heart of God is keeping people out of hell. The Bible teaches that there is rejoicing in heaven in the presence of the angels when a lost person or a, 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 a sinner um, repents or changes their mind about what they did believe, or maybe they didn't believe in anything. Maybe they were aimless, and they said, okay, I'm going to take this faith that I have and fix it upon Jesus Christ. We talked about motives, 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 and I got into, uh, we talked about four different judgments. What kind of judgments are there? The Bible teaches the four judgments very quickly in review. The first judgment is the judgment of Calvary, the judgment of Calvary. The sin was finished on Calvary. It was, it was taken care of. The judgment that God had on the wrath of man it was paid for at Calvary. The second judgment and found in the Bible is the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. And we explained that. We, we kind of went through that and talked about, um, I remember I pulled the screen down and I said, thank goodness, thank the Lord that my life isn't going to be put on the big screen for everybody to see. I used to think that, oh, sure, I'm saved. But when I get to heaven, God's my rewards, like the, how I live in heaven, like the 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 quality of my eternal life in heaven depends on how I lived on earth and everybody's going to have their popcorn and soda and candy bars watching the life of Jake Jackson. And I'm going to be in the back of the back of the, 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 uh, I'm going to be on trial with the dunce hat on, so to speak, blushing the whole time because I said things and did things and thought things and went places and I, that I should not have done and went and gone and said and thought you with me, but Whoo! That's not the way it works, amen. Thank the Lord, thank the Lord that it's not, it's judged. That judgment, get this, that was taken care of on Calvary. How great is that? That my sins are under the blood. The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west. Now, can you tell me how far the east is from the west? You can't. Why? Because it's perpetual. It's perpetual. The east can never catch the west, never. It's continually moving in that direction. We'll never catch it. As, far, as long as east is moving west, west is moving west. Never catch it. East. Uh, as far as the east is from the west. As far as the east is from the west, get this, so far hath the Lord removed our sins from us. Man, I love that. He's buried them in the deepest part of the sea. Man, that, that, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. So the judgment seat of Christ. And then third judgment, uh, which isn't a lot, it's not very much known. It's not very much taught. But I'm but, um, reading through some of these guys' books and reading what I, um, uh, and scripture, of course, there's something called the judgment of the nations. Now, the judgment of the nations is how you treated Israel. How did you treat my, my chosen? And now that's, that's, that's deep. That's put on your, your theo theological scuba, scuba, scuba suit. And let's go into the depths of all that, but we're not touching that. Uh, and then the fourth one is something called the great white throne judgment, the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium, when Jesus Christ has his thousand year reign on earth, uh, uh, and, um, uh, he gets ready to say, okay, I gave everybody throughout all ages. It is the end of time as we know it. And I've given everybody ample opportunity to turn to me. You have chosen me or you have not chosen me. Now, the, the, uh, during this millennial reign, the, the devil will be chained. The, je the devil will be chained in, in, in hell. And the Bible says that he'll be loosed for a season to deceive the nations again. And then the nations, all the people that have rejected Christ as he sat on the throne in Jerusalem, all the people will turn against him again and they'll gather together to think that they're going to cause some sort of damage. And there's no war this time. There's no blood up to the horse's br bridle this time. It's God speaks the word and they are consumed with fire. <laughs> Gone. God speaks the word. He says, I've had enough of this. The word, whatever the word is, whatever the word, the words are, 
let it be done or away with you or I never knew, I don't know. But whatever he speaks, it'll be done, they'll be consumed. And then all that are left are believers in Christ. And the Bible says that he'll melt away the world with a fervent heat and he'll create a new heaven and a new earth. Whew, that's after the great, and then the great white throne judgment, amen, where everybody gets their due. Um, uh, so we got the, the judgments and then what will God judge at the judgment seat of Christ? And we talked about that. Gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble. What are you building? What are you building? Okay, anybody, you're saved? I think everybody in here is saved. We've got a saved group of believers tonight. Okay, good, a few of you. We got, a, we got a saved group of believers. Okay, so if you're saved, you have this, you, you have a foundation called Jesus Christ. He is the foundation for your life. What are you building on Jesus? What is your life? What are you doing? What works are you creating? What works are you bearing? What fruits are you bearing in Christ? The works that we're doing. Okay. Uh, wood, hay, stubble. Gold, silver, precious stone, because the Bible says they're going to be tried by fire. Now, I don't know if a, an angel in a, in a flame retardant suit and a flamethrower is going to show up, you know, and all my works are going to be piled up there uh, and on the altar, and he's going to, you know, soak them down with a flamethrower, or he's just going to cast it from his hands, or, or the Lord's going to speak it from his mouth, or, how, or a fire will come down from above and consume, like the Bible often portrays, the fire comes down from above, or if it'll come up, you know, like it'll set it on fire. And all my life's works, all of them, the business I built, the family I built, the church that the Lord built through me. Ah, Jesus will build his church. Uh, um, uh, 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 all the different things, you know, all, the, the, all the, the things that my hand in my life partook of and helped build all the works of my life, they're going to be tried by fire. And whatever remains is my increase. But the Bible says here that if you that if things are burned up, you'll suffer loss. You'll, you'll suffer loss. Anybody ever hear you put money in the stock market and you lost money? You suffered loss. Maybe, um, uh, well, I don't want to hit too close to home on some things, but whatever the case is, you had something of value and it was stolen or it was uh, 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 whatever the case may be. You suffered loss. You know what stinks? Suffering loss. I don't like to suffer loss. I like gains, amen? It'd be like going and working out all the time and you lose muscle mass. Like, what's the point of doing all this if I'm gonna lose muscle mass? I wanna work out and be shredded. I wanna have muscles. I wanna, no, of course. You wanna work out and gain. You wanna invest and gain. You want to save and gain. That's what you wanna do. You wanna gain. Nobody wants to lose unless it's weight. Amen. Uh, we want to. We, nobody wants to suffer loss. Nobody does. But the Bible clearly states here that the works that we have done, they will be put on the altar, and they will be tried by fire, and we will suffer loss. I know that I am going to suffer loss. There are going to be things that are put on the altar of the life of Jake Jackson that are going to be burned up. I understand that. All, all of my, some of my works are wood, hay, stubble. I'm sure that they are or have been in the past. But I want to make sure that I'm throwing on some, some eternal works. I want to make sure that I'm, I'm doing what the Bible tells me to do. Now, you say, well, how do you get these eternal works? Well, that comes from, and I mentioned my father last week. He just said he was, net, of course, he wasn't perfect and, and uh, maybe not uh, even a perfect pastor. And he gave it all his heart. He said, but I just try to do one thing. I just try to obey the Bible. That's just what, what does the Bible say? 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 And that's kind of what the driving point was last week. I don't care what motive, what motive you obeyed the Lord with as long as you obeyed. Now, Paul says we should do it with a happy heart. We should give cheerfully. We should go gladly. We should, uh, uh, we had this thing growing up. What should we say? What do we say when we obey? Yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. I'll be glad to. Well, I wasn't really glad to. But my mom and dad didn't care if I was glad to or not. Obey, do what you were told. And I wasn't allowed to walk away and slam doors and grumble and stomp my feet. And, nah, I wasn't, mm. mom and dad, that didn't fly. I'd fly. Uh, but mom and dad, they, I, I don't care if you're happy about it or not, do it. You know, God's not, God's not really concerned if you're happy about it or not. Do it. Well, I'm not happy to tithe. I don't care. Do it anyway. 
Well, I'm not real happy to go and tell anybody about, you know, the Lord. I just kind of, how could you, number one, how could you not be happy? Something's really wrong with that. But I just, I just really don't want to. I don't care if you want to or not. Do it. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, such as the manner of some is. Well, you know, my, I don't really like to gather at church anymore. I don't care. Do it. Obey. Obey. We talked about the, the attitude of, uh, uh, of, of, um, of resistance. You know, I really don't want to obey anyway. Or you get somebody who's all on the, the opposite end of the spectrum, who's like a glory hound, who says, oh, I find much glory and all this good, the pomp and circumstance of being super religious and everybody looking to them. I don't, of course, if they're, if they're prideful about it, God will humble them. But the fact of the matter is, is, it doesn't matter if you're doing it for your own glory or not, as long as you're obeying. God wants you to obey the Bible. Obey him. He'll iron out the details. Oh, you're resistant? I'll humble you. Or I'll, 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 I'll break your spirit. I'll, I'll break your spirit. Oh, you're, you're, you're prideful about it? I'll humble you. I'll humble you. Uh, because many people, they... Uh, uh, brother Bob, brother, brother Bob Gray said, um, uh, you gotta be a fool. Basically he said, you gotta be a fool to think that, you know, there's glory in soul winning for yourself. There's no glory for yourself. People slam doors on you and dogs bark at you and people don't want you there. And you're intrusive. You're knocking on people's doors. He said, there's no personal glory, but there is glory for him. There's glory for heaven. See, I don't go soul winning. I don't tell people about Jesus for my own glory. Sometimes it's difficult to be a soul winner. Sometimes you're trying to find a way to slide in the gospel. You know, you're trying to make the conversation go that way. It's not for me. It's work. It's work to be a soul winner. It, every time I go to pick up Bill, I go in the morning, I pick up Bill, and I slide into the, the PNC uh, ATM there, and I pull out my tithe. Sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes that's hard to do. But the more that I do it, the more that I obey, the Lord gives me peace in my obedience. You're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing. And then when I do the wrong thing, there's always that voice in my head. I think it's called the Holy Spirit or my conscience, you know, saying, you know, you know you didn't do what you were supposed to do today. You know you missed that step. You know you should have done this. You know that, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when I do the right thing, I lay down with my head in peace. I lay my, my head down on my pillow in peace. I lay down saying, I did right today. That's, that's worth it. Laying down and, and having peace and having comfort. And now, your motives of which you serve the Lord with. Good intentions aren't enough. You have to be obedient. You can't just sit at home and, and watch TV or watch church on TV and think that's it. Good intentions don't cut it. You got to get to the church house. Now, uh, we talked about very quickly about how God will judge. How, 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 will, how will God judge? God will judge according to his book. But the Bible says, uh, in 2 Peter uh, 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 2 Peter 3.13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, as we mentioned um, earlier last week, would hay stubble be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ, gold, silver, precious stones, will also be tried by fire, but they will, uh, uh, they will withstand the fire. Now, um, the Bible says sorts. What sorts of works? The Bible says, uh, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man uh, build upon the foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, pause, or as my dad would say, full stop. That says, full stop. Here's a thought, full stop. Here's a thought. Full stop. And I'm like, I can't. I'm still coasting. Just let's roll with that for a minute. Um, um, but there are two groups of materials found in these verses. The first group are lasting materials. The second group are materials that will be consumed and burned up. It's a description of two works that a, Christian's can, that a Christian can do. I'm not talking about lost people tonight. I'm talking about saved people. I'm talking about born-again Christians. You can lose works. 
lose them. Um, now, the judgment seat of Christ, at the judgment seat of Christ, the person's works will be sorted to decide what types they are. Now, remember, God is talking uh, um, uh, to these born-again Christians, uh, through obviously through Scripture. Um, in these verses, Jesus Christ is the foundation of faith. He's the foundation of faith and the only foundation for salvation. So once we get saved, Christian, Lucas and Houston, young enough to, to still have your whole life ahead of you, so to speak, uh, you can build the wrong kind of building on the foundation. You can build the wrong, you can lay up all kinds of bad works. You're saved, but what'd you build on it? What in the world did you build on that foundation? Um, you know, when uh, it, it'd be like this, um, uh, if you build a skyscraper, depending on how tall it's going to go, you can't just lay the foundation on the, on the surface and start to build up. You've got to go down. You've got you've to dig into the earth. You've got to make a huge, massive foundation underneath to be able to support that big of a building on top of it. So if you're going to lay a foundation for a skyscraper, why in the world would you build a tent on it? Why in the world would you just set up a tent? That's the kind of, that's a wrong kind of building, if you will, that belongs on that foundation. Why would you put a ranch style home on a skyscraper foundation? That's the wrong kind of building. You see, what we need is such, since we have such a great foundation, we need to build great works. God has said that we can do great works. That's not prosperity gospel, you guys in my class. You are awesome. You are so blessed. You are, you are everything you need to be and more. I can't even be like, I can't even talk like those guys. Those guys are so good at massaging people's spiritual feelings. I can't even fake it. Um, uh, but um, uh, uh, let's move past that. The foundation of the Lord is a great foundation. You got to build the right kind of building on it. You got to put the right kind of works on it. So, uh, uh, very quickly, can we? Can can uh, uh, you? Can you consume fire with gold? No, you can melt it down and form it. I get that, but you can't. It, it isn't consumed. Uh, uh, can you burn silver with fire? No. What about precious stones? No, they withstand it. They withstand it, but all that other stuff, wood, hay, stubble, it burns up. It burns, it burns, wood, hay, stubble. Well, the Bible says where there is no uh, wood, the fire go without. You need that, that stuff burns. Man, we've burned so, tens of thousands of scrap pallets and all kinds of stuff over the years, bonfires and, bon man, I love a good bonfire, but what do I put in the, bon the bonfire? Does anybody have a necklace? Some rings? No. What about some wood? What about some, some, some twigs, some leaves thrown on the fire? Get it all smoky, you know? Uh, uh, some hay. Let's get this thing started. What do you need? It, it burns up. It consumes. It consumes it. So since then, when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, the works that will be rewarded of those that are made of gold and silver and precious stones. Now, the works uh, uh, that will not be rewarded, of course, are those that are burned up. Now, fresh stuff right here. Uh, there are those who say motives. Motives will be rewarded. Uh, I, I, you know what? I, I briefly got into this last week. Their motives will be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ because God knows our heart. No, the Bible says he that basic, um, um, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Do you know what hearing does? It motivates me. It motivates me. But if I don't take that motivation and do something with it, then it did nothing. It, it absolutely did nothing. I just took the fuel and I put it into the vehicle. But if I don't start that vehicle up, it burns no fuel. It, I don't go anywhere. As we watch that video in our Sunday school class, man, I get motivated. Motivated. The more I watch that, and the more angry I get at these false teachers and these liars, and I feel sorry for people who are dying and going to hell, and I feel motivated. 
I've watched movies of, uh, you know, the, the, little, the little guy overcoming the big guy and the big guy becoming humbled and becoming the little guy's friend and about an anti-bully and about a team that overcame and a guy that overcame and um, uh, the American Revolution, you know, and I'm like, yeah, that motivates me to be a patriot. Let's go find some red coats. Oh, they're, they're all dead. Um, uh, let's go find some bad guys. Let's go. Let's make America great again. Amen. Let's, um, uh, uh. And I don't, that's not a plug for Donald Trump. I'm just saying, it motivates me to love my country. The first thing I do, what do I do, man? I go and put on my American flag t-shirt, you know. I will dress out in red, white, and blue. The boys will watch some sort of um, uh, uh, superhero thing or whatever. And what do they do? They go get the shield. They go get the, what did that movie do? It motivated them to act out their, that character or that person. And man, when I see things and I hear things, it motivates me. But it's got to motivate me to good works. The motivation without the action is empty. It's empty. Now, I don't want to be empty-handed at, at the judgment seat. I don't want my, listen, my motivations. God, I, I, I had good intentions. God, I'm like, that, that's good. I'm glad that had good, in, I'm glad you had good intentions, but you didn't do anything with it. What are you gonna? What are you gonna do with it? Um, Christmas time is gonna come up, and people are gonna sit around and say, "You know, uh, uh, I, this is what I got you, but what I really wanted to get you was da da da." And it's some great extravagant, extra, extravagant gift. And I'm like, "Thanks for the thought." And that's what people say. It's the thought that counts. That's a lie. I'm glad you thought good. I'm glad that you had good feelings toward me. I'm glad that you thought well of me, but it stops right there because that's all it was, was a thought. That's all it was, was a, you, you wished you could do something better. You know what really counts? Doing something better. According to this book, I'm not talking about your Christmas gifts and all that because we all want to. I would love to buy my wife whatever she wanted. I'd like to be able to surprise her with, you know, you know those commercials where people, you know, buy the, the extravagant cars and it's got a big red bow on it. I'd be, I'd love to be able to do that. So this year, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get look, a, a little matchbox. And I'm so poor, I can't afford a bow. So I'll draw a bow, I'll draw a bow on top. <laughs> it's the thought that counts. No, that's like, gee, thanks. What do they say? So close, but yet so far. Um, uh, uh, you got, it's the doing. It's the doing, especially in the spiritual realm of serving God. We all want to do great things for our family members and what holds us back? Time and money. Time and money, the things that we, that we covet so much that we lack so little of. But people say, uh, when it comes to this, that God knows your heart, and, and he's going to reward you or, uh, or scold you for that. They teach that uh, we'll give God the glory for what we have done, and that's uh, how we'll be rewarded. And that's not true. You can't find that in the Bible. That teaching's not in the Bible. During these days and times that we're living in, everyone is judging motives, 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 motives. And that's good. I'm glad you have the motive, but take that next step and do something with it. Uh, uh, I want to, I've, I've talked about that point about your motives, but uh, last week I very briefly got into motives and obedience. Motives and obedience. Whether you do it with a cheerful heart, a sad heart, a mad heart, a glad heart, uh, an I don't want to heart, whatever, just obey. Obey. The coach calls the play. You may not like that play, but do what the coach says. Do what the coach says. The parent said, gave the command. Doesn't matter. Do what the parent said. Hey, Moses said, hey, look to, the, look to the, 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 the staff and the serpent on it. Look and live. Well, I just, I don't like snakes. So what? Look to, this, look to that image. Look to that representation of what God told Moses to do and live. If you don't, die. Go off and die then. Well, that's just, that's just harsh. I don't know what to tell you. I, you know, people need to come to grips with some harsh things in life. We're such a fragile people. Oh, we can stand the violence of a, of a John Wick movie. 
We can stand the violence of a patriot, a patriot movie or um, uh, the violence of life and wow, the men that went through World War II in Vietnam and, 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 and wow, and, and, and wow we, we, we hold those guys up. But when it comes to standing at the, the, the front door of our home or coming to the standing at the front of our cave and saying, come on, boy, come on with it. Let's do something about or making a decision in life or standing for some sort of truth. We say, well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And, you know, I don't, uh, you know, I want to preach hard, but I want to preach biblical. You know, the, the folks that I scolded about being in, uh, about, uh, about downtown, that church downtown, about faith and art and, and putting up the, 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 the flag that has been robbed from the rainbow of God to make it into a homosexual image. Pride. Yeah, pride goeth before a fall, and it is a continual fall if you don't get saved. Uh, art, no, 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 no. It's not, there's nothing about the gospel, nothing about Jesus saves, nothing about any of that. And I called them fruitcakes. And I told Brother Alex, I said, I don't want to do that. I may feel that way, but I want to preach hard and I want to preach biblical, but I don't want to go off, I don't want to go off track. And I don't care what, I don't care what the, and I understand, I don't care what the world thinks necessarily, but if the word fruitcake is what keeps, if that one thing is what keeps somebody from being intrigued enough, like Agrippa said, man, Paul, I'm almost persuaded to be a Christian. And if I could, if I could be used as a vessel of God to convert somebody, but I was just human enough in my preaching. I was just fleshly enough in my preaching. See, I don't want Jake to preach. I want the Holy Spirit of God to speak through me. And that may sound high and mighty or hoity-toity spiritually, but I, that's what I desire. I want the Holy Spirit of God to speak through me, to use my voice, to talk to my heart and my brain, if he can lasso that thing and, and kind of put me on the horse. If the Holy Spirit can get on the horse of my heart and my brain and it doesn't buck them off anywhere, you know, if, if, if he can tame that thing, I want the Holy Spirit to speak through me because that video a couple of weeks ago reached almost 7,000 people. Uh, not all of them were saved. And the one that I said fruitcake in, uh, I think two, almost two and a half thousand people. Uh, so I just want to be smart with what I do and what I say. My motives, get this, my motives were, were good. My motives were good, but sometimes our good motives can go astray also. I want to be obedient to the word. I want God to handle the, the, the fruitcakes. I want God to handle the folks downtown. I want God to handle them. So I'm going to preach Jesus, and I am going to preach against false doctrine but I'm going to do the best I can without going outside the bounds of what the Bible describes them as. I will call them serpents. I'll call them wolves. I'll call them deceivers and apostate and antichrists uh, uh, and morons. Amen. It's, it's, it's Greek. I can say it, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's moros, um, uh, but motives and obedience. God just wants you to obey. God just wants you to obey. Uh, Paul said, be instant in season and out of season. Good and bad, hot and cold. Be consistent. Be consistent. No, um, who was it? Somebody and I were talking about um, someone, not in a gossiping way, and I said, listen, I think they're, they, they may be, to some extent, following after what I've said. I don't care if you come in here hard-hearted. I don't care if you come in here and don't listen. Now, you should. Because there have been many times I've came in and I've sat in where you're sitting now and my mind was somewhere else and I was out somewhere else. My mind wasn't there, but I caught a sentence. I caught a phrase. I caught a paragraph of the sermon, if you will. I caught a point here and there. Something was funny, something intrigued, and Pastor Jackson always did a good job of incorporating and including uh, the congregation, asking questions. Shake your little heads up and down. You don't laugh when you think it's funny. You laugh when I think it's funny. You know, things like that. And, 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 um, uh, and I told this person, I said, that person may be following my advice. Just show up. Just show up. 
hard-hearted, soft-hearted, no-hearted. Show up to church as backslidden as you possibly can be. Show up to church and hit the altar. Every service, I hit the altar. Sometimes I'd come up here and say, dear God, I don't even know what to say. Here, God, here, here, I got, I got something for you, God. God says, I get it. I get it. God, I don't even have any words. But you know what I was doing? Obeying. We live in a time where it's obey your thirst. Obey your feelings. Obey your cravings. Obey you. But we've gotten to the point now where the government has, with this little test called COVID and lockdowns, where they say, how much can we get the the people to obey us? I think they did a pretty good job. Obey. Folks, you're going to obey somebody. I'd rather obey God. And what did the disciples say? We ought to obey God. You finish it. Yeah, amen. And guess who's a man? The government's full of men, and I mean mankind. But who else is a man and mankind? Me. I am mankind. It's better to obey God than it is me. You. Now, what it, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. He says, For we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God, and house made with hands, eternal, in the heavens. Now, the Bible refers to our fleshly bodies as the tabernacle. Somebody asked me one time about tattoos. They said, are tattoos wrong? I said, well, the Levitical law said, make no markings upon yourself. Now, the New Testament doesn't say tattoos. Not that I know of, and like I'm not a Bible scholar yet. Um, uh, uh, and I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but I don't believe that command is given in this time because it was so gospel-focused to the Greeks and the barbarians and the Jews and everybody in between that they had not yet, in, they had not yet got to, you know, you, you shouldn't do that. You know, and here's the reason why. Because the, during the New Testament time, it was heavy, 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 gospel infusion, gospel, 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 gospel. And what had happened is amongst, like say Peter and James, specifically James, the the brother of Jesus, uh, uh, and Paul, uh, uh, and, and religious people, they said, well, okay, we understand that these Gentiles are getting saved, but shouldn't they observe and do the, the Jewish customs? And Paul was like, no, that is, no, that's not a requirement. Now, you can keep doing them if you want to. Uh, the, I think they call it sh- Shabbat or Shabbat, and, um, uh, the, where they have feasts together and recognize the Passover and all the different kinds of things that they did. Um, uh, Peter and, um, uh, uh, and James, they really kind of, look, we'll take, the, we'll take the, the Jews, and Paul, you, you take the Gentiles. Uh, now, Peter did speak to Gentiles, and, 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 and the word of God is, uh, prevalent to everyone, uh, whether it's to the Jew or, or to uh, the the barbarian. We got a couple barbarians up here, uh, uh, or to the Gentiles. Amen. Um, but um, our bodies is the temple. So I told this person. I said, "Listen, put it this way: What do we f- refer to as the house of God?" And they said, "The church." I said, "Okay, well, where's our church?" And they said, "Okay, it's fourteen oh six Lombard Street." I said, "Okay, good. Now, how would you like it if somebody came up and graffitied all over the church building?" They said, oh, that, that wouldn't be good. You know, we don't want graffiti on the church building and on the bus and on the property. I said, right, we don't want that. Why? Because it's the church building. I said, well, let's go a little deeper. I said, the Bible calls you the tabernacle of God. You are the, the temple of God. Now, should you put tattoos all over your body, all over the temple of God? And they say, ah, okay, I guess not. Now, Is it the end of the world if you got a tattoo? No, because Jesus told the Pharisees and those listening, he said, it is not the thing that you put into your body that defiles you. Or the thing, here, let's go further. It's not the thing that you put on your body that defiles you. It's the thing that comes out of you that defiles you. It's the thing that comes out of your heart. It's the thing, and they talked about, and they talked about washing hands. Hey, your disciples didn't wash their hands. What's going on? It's the thing that goes into your body, Jesus said. 
excuse me, the things that come into you. Because they were talking about, oh man, they didn't wash their hands. And Jesus said, it's the thing that, it's not the thing that comes out of you. Forgive me, I'm reverting. It, it, it's, it's not the thing that comes out of you that defiles a man. It's the things that you put in it. So I like Coke. I like Pepsi. I like Mountain Dew. I like sugary stuff. I like salty stuff. I like sweet stuff. I like candy. I like burgers. I like ribs. I like all those things. And I don't think they're wrong until I start, uh, until they start to hurt my body. Because get this, this is not my body. I want to be in shape for the glory of Lord. I want to be healthy for the glory of Lord. But if I'm, uh, if I'm not healthy, if my, my, my health is robbed from me. Now listen, I don't want to, anybody in here, will you want to lose your health? No. But I only want to lose my health if God takes it from me. I don't want to surrender it. I don't want to surrender my health. I remember all the old heads, and forgive me, I'll say the OGs. All the OGs in the church, they would say, Brother Jake, you're going to regret that when you're older. Brother Jake, don't pick that up. Don't carry that. Don't jump off of there. You're going to regret that when you're older. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I did? I did it anyway. You know what I'm doing today? Regretting it. <laughs> ah, my back. Brother Pip's like, yeah, that's from when you picked up that box by yourself. And, and uh, I said, oh, man, my knees. And Brother Kevin said, yeah, that's from when you jumped off that roof. And I said, ah, oh, my body. And that's when they said you tried to jump over that car and, and um, jump out that window. And you regret it. Now, I don't want to surrender my health by my own foolishness and my own stupidity and my own carelessness. If I'm going to lose my health, I want it to be because God took it from me to use for his glory. But I want to stay healthy so I can work for the night is coming. I want to use this and, and, and use my body as the tabernacle for God. Now, the tabernacle was mostly wood. Get this. During the, the Mosaic times, it's wood, hay, and stubble. I know there's all kinds of uh, things in the tabernacle that went into it until, especially when they got resources to really, really build it. The tabernacle was mostly made up of these things. Paul is saying that the tabernacle is a type of our fleshly body, which is temporal. Our fleshly body is temporal. I told my buddy Gino, and he's a big workout guy, you know, got all the magazines and trophies, and he goes to shows and competes and all those things. And I told him, I said, bro, you're going to get old. And it was like I cursed his mama. Ah, don't say that. I said, brother, you're going to get old. I said, how cool. Oh, so you're 80 years old and you got a bicep. Big whoop. Big whoop. I'd rather, well, I know I want to say I'd rather have a big gut and grandkids. I don't want a big gut. Um, uh, but, uh, uh I'm, I'm on my way though. Uh, just food's too good. Hey man, it's just too good. But I told him, I said, bro, you're going to get old. Those muscles are going to get droopy. Your chest is going to concave. Hey man, you're going to get wings under here. It was like, I mean, he got mad. I'm like, calm down, dude. I said, you're going to die. You are going to die. Now, live healthy, build your muscles. I'm all for that. I like that stuff. It's competition to me. It's, um, uh, uh, I don't, I'm not in a lot of sports. I'm not in any sports now, unless it's a video game or something. So I compete with me. And I say, I'm going to lift that weight. I'm going to push that weight. I'm going to move that weight. And it's competition with me. I do it for health reasons um, uh, and whatnot. But um, I like it. It's my avenue. It's my kind of escape. So I like it, but not to the point where my body becomes an idol and an image and, and, and my body is my God. No, my body is used for God. That's why I want it to be healthy. So I told this guy, man, you're going to die. No, don't say that. But you're going to. So don't let your life just be all of muscles and, 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 no, and, no, um, uh, um, and no earthly, no, no precious stones. And Paul says, this body is going to drop one day. This is a temporal body. So when God talks about gold, silver, and precious stones, he's talking about, I believe, a glorified life, a life that is bearing fruit, a life that I told Kinsey, I said, okay, Miss Harrington's not here anymore. Um, and all these different things. I said, put a song in your heart and just sing. Just sing, exercise that voice, exercise it. And I asked her, I said, are you saved? Yeah. Well, then just sing because you're saved. Just sing because you're saved. Why? Because you have a glorified life, a glorified life. One day I'll drop this robe of flesh and rise to meet him in the skies. And I'll have a glorified body. 
So a, a glorified life, the gold, silver, and precious stones represent a heavenly life, while the wood and the hay and the precious stone, they represent our earthly life. Now, four minutes. The tabernacle had two divisions. It had the outside, duh, which was, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if I had it up on a screen, you, you could see what I was talking about. Yeah, the outside of it, which was um, the holy place, and it had the inside, which was called the holy of holies, and you couldn't just waltz in there. If you just waltz in there, you'd be getting dragged out. Um, uh, uh, but um, uh, the, the holy of holies, any priest could enter the outside, uh, uh, the Holy of Holies, but only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. So uh, any priest, the, 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 the Levites who were given, that was their, their, um, their lot, was to be the, the keepers of the tabernacle and to be the, the, the men who did the sacrifices, that tribe. So any priest of the Levites could go amongst the outside of the holy place, but only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was the room of uh, the gold, it had the mercy seat, was solid gold. Uh, the Bible says it was 15 feet high, 15 feet wide, 15 feet long. Revelation 21, 16, it says that uh, heaven is 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long. My mind can't, it can't compute. Now, I get math, but to me, that's a cube, a cube. So if all the people that are going to heaven, which there's got to be a couple billion of them throughout the ages, I mean, right? A few billion? Uh, throughout all the populations of the earth, throughout everybody that's ever lived, the billions and billions that have lived, there's got to be a couple billion that have heard the, the gospel and believed on Jesus Christ. So 1,500 by 1,500 by 1,500, that's a cube. So in my understanding, that's got to be like layers I don't, I hope I'm not in the basement of heaven. Amen. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to be in the basement. Uh, uh, put me on the, put me on, put me in the attic, but don't put me in the basement. Amen. Um, uh, but uh, 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 the 1500 by 1500 by 1500. It, I, I don't know what, what kind of significance that is, but uh, uh, according to the Bible, what will happen to the wood and the hay and the stubble at the judgment seat of Christ? What's going to happen to it? It's going to be burned up. Therefore, the wood, the hay, and the stubble that will be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ are the works that were done on earth for earthly good. You know, when I, I sometimes I, I, I still question myself. I got my little LLC, you know, I was so excited about it. And then it's like, boom, it hit a wall. And I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm, I'm jumping through all these hoops and I'm doing all this stuff and I'm going through all these, I, I'm, I'm doing everything that I'm doing because for you, I, I want to honor you in all that I do. I don't want to be a pastor and a business owner. That's not the goal. If I have to be a pastor and a small business owner for some time so I can be a full-time pastor, that's the goal. That's what I want to do. And it looks like wasted money, and it feels like wasted money. And it, but I'm telling you, through my prayer time and through going to the Lord, he's, nope, Jake, it all happened for a reason. It's all happening for a purpose. I've got it under control. You see, I, my home is not here. Lucas asked me the other day, he said, Dad, what's your favorite kind of home? And I said, one that's got a roof, <laughs> one that I can sleep in, you know, one that I can. And, and listen, I look at Zillow and Realtor.com just like everybody else and go, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, wow, ooh. I like houses. I like cars. I like pet dogs and, and um, uh, the amenities that come in. I like a comfy couch. I like a high-definition television to say, he fumbled, you know, and, and the Bears lost. And if I'm going to watch the Bears lose, I want to see him do it in style. Um, you know, I, I want to be comfortable, but I don't want to work and sweat and toil and bleed and cry and yearn to keep up with the Joneses. I want to work and sweat and bleed and cry and toil and labor for Jesus. And when I dedicate my life to Jesus and I give it to Jesus, uh, uh, gold, silver, precious stones. That, that's, that's what it is. What are you working for? What are you trying to add up for. I want to hurry up and retire so I can be comfortable. That's cool. Take your retirement and do something for Christ. 
I want to, I'm in my 40s and I'm looking for retirement. Sucker, buckle up. Buckle up. Do something for the Lord Jesus. Don't just take your life and make it yours. Use your life for God. What know ye not? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your members. And when we glorify God with a glorified life and we build up gold, silver, and precious stones, we don't have to be afraid of a great loss at the judgment seat. You don't have to be afraid of that. So gold, silver, and precious stones, they're the things that, that when we as Christians, what we do on earth for heaven. Do on earth for heaven. When they are tried, the Bible says, by fire, those things will last. Why? Because they are precious in God's sight. God, God is interested in people who are interested in his agenda. And I'm not great at it. I'm not perfect at it. I'm still figuring that out, so to speak. I got a great, I got, I got a lot of the pieces in, in, in where there's, where they belong. But I want to live this life as an investment into heaven. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. That part A. For you are dead in your life. I said, I got to get all that. But don't set your affections on the things of earth, and they are pretty cool. Doesn't, doesn't earth have a lot of cool stuff? Doesn't, I mean, it's got caves, it's got zip lining, it's got, um, what do they call that? Gliding, paragliding, what's it called? Something gliding. Hang gliding, parachuting, parasailing, swim with the sharks, spurlunking, diving, skydiving, learn how to fly a helicopter, learn how to fly a plane, go on a cruise, go see the sights. The world is cool. It's got all kinds of cool stuff in it. And it's so cool and so attractive that it can be a distraction for the Christian who doesn't have their mind set on the things above. And here's the great thing about setting your thing, setting your sight on above. When you do that, God gives you the means and God gives you the time to enjoy the cool things. That's it. I can't tell you. We worked went Three Years Baptist Church in the Jackson family and your, your bunch of your families. We worked, work, 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 hardcore, stay out, go. And not as a dictator, but it was go, work, 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 work. And we'd work hard in everything that we did. But guess what we got to do? We got to go to the basketball tournaments. We got to, as a school, go to Detroit Tigers games and go up to Mackinac City and the island and relax and ride on horses and, and ride brand new bikes and watch Pastor Jackson fly off the front of the handlebars. I'm not kidding, Brother Alex. My dad was probably doing 25 mile an hour coming down that hill, easy. Come on, yeah? Had to have been. And he, what he wanted to do was hit the back brakes and slide in. Cool. That didn't happen. He hit the front brakes and went, Superman! <laughs> Shoo! And I mean, and he hit the ground, boom, and rolled. And there's a trolley up there, and they wouldn't take him down. He's like, all right, I'll ride my bike down. Broken shoulder, messed up, man, messed up. Um, so he stayed in the hotel room the rest of the week, and we partied. Uh, we <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah, gave him bike it, and that's where it all. Yeah, <laughs> gave him bike it, and he parted. Yeah, I ain't got to deal with them kids. This is perfect. Addy, here's some money. Go buy him ice cream. You know, just, <laughs> you know. I was wondering. He was extra generous on that trip. I was wondering why. Now we know why. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, when you serve God and you work for the Lord, he'll he always makes time for you to enjoy the things of life. There's always a banquet. There's always a party. There's always fellowship. There's always enjoyment. God lets you stop and smell the roses. And I'll tell you this, and I'm done. The roses always smell sweeter having worked for the Lord than they would smell having served self. There's just something different. I think God, listen, I know, here we go, hooky spooky. I think God may let you have a little bit more open senses 
let you think a little deeper. Speak a little clearer. I think maybe be a little more connected to touch, taste, feel, smell, and see. And maybe, and listen, I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't back that up necessarily, but that's just a thought. When we serve God and we do it wholeheartedly, I think maybe by his goodness and his grace, he allows us to enjoy life a little more than maybe than we would have living for self. Just a thought. So I don't care what your, what your motives are, what your intentions are. It's the work that matters. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I'm not going to have an invitation tonight, but what I want you to do is I want you to take a moment while I'm speaking, reflect on your life and say, and not pat yourself on the back and say, man, I've done good works for the Lord. But look at it and say, if I have done good works for the Lord, then I'm going to continue it until the day I die. If I have worked in this life for heaven, then I'm going to continue. There's no sense in stopping now. Those of you who can no longer go as fast as you used to go and go as long as you used to go, and go as far and give as much as you used to give, that's okay. Just don't stop. You may not be able to have the RPMs up all the way, but it doesn't mean you got to stall out. Keep going. Plod if you have to. It doesn't matter how slow you go as long as you just keep going. The Lord knows your frame. He remembers you're made of dust. He remembers what you're made of. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. But God knows that one day you'll, you'll pass away. What will your life have amounted to? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, I'd ask that you'd help us to live for you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can look up here for one second. I want to read this to you. I, I, this is what I read at Brother White's funeral. Uh, Brother Pip, you can get up if you need to. Your knee and whatnot. If you got to get up, you can get up. Leave you, Packers fan. Get at it. No. Uh, uh, this is what I read at. <laughs> yeah. They're like, oh, the Packers lost. I guess we'll lose too. Um, uh, people remember how you start and how you finish, but they often forget what you did in between. Well, there may be some truth to this statement. What you do in between is a reflection on how you started and an indication on where you will finish. What you do in between is maintaining your cause. Now, I have more there, but I'm not going to read it. And I always talked about um, the life that's lived, the tombstone. What's the most important mark on the tombstone? The name, the date. No, it's the dash in between. That little dash in between the birth date and death date, that's the story of their life. What is that dash? You know, and really nobody knows. The family carries it around, but they, they forget because that family is going to die too. Who really knows? He does. And this man right here, Brother White, he might have been living for self and living and, and building up some wood hay stubble. But I thank God for leading him to Three Rivers Baptist Church. And I thank God for all he did and all the friends he made and all the influence he had uh, in meeting my father and listening to the Bible, following the man of God, marrying Mrs. White. And I think by far he was laying up gold, silver, precious stones by the time for the last 20 years of his life. By the time he came to this church, he stopped. He hopped right into the buses. I mean, almost just hopped. He and Eddie Galleon right into the buses. For the last 20, 20 years, 22 years of his life, Brother White was laying up gold, silver, precious stones. So you, you, know, you can start from where you are. You can say, oh, no. What's, you can start from where you are. That dash in between tells your life story. What are you going to put in there? You write it.
let God handle it. Uh, zip my lip, let Miss Jennifer play, you're dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>